uh, your lordship be pleased to lay down the order of address. We have three amicus and present here. I've already filed my brief. I'm happy okay. to start. And, and, and I need to do So you may begin. What? You, then, then you went to three. I think, how much time do you take? Me. Uh, well, look, since I put everything down in writing, I would like to go very fast with okay. your permission. You'll be able to I don't want to take time over it. I think then you'll be able to conclude today, so you start. I beg my lord's pardon? I said, then you'll be able to conclude today, I said. Uh, uh, most likely, if not, other you are not will allow me to continue. Yes, yes, we are not prohibiting anybody. Very well. well lord, uh, I would prefer to address the second question first. Uh, your Lordship is aware that these each reference has been made in two stages. The first was on powers under 142 yeah. to deal with a divorce by dispensing the period of in a mutual consent divorce or 18 months at the outer limit, whether under 142 a divorce can be granted. In my opinion, my Lord, that's a relatively easy question to answer. But my lord, your lordship made a subsequent reference on the question whether irretrievable breakdown divorce can be granted, notwithstanding the fact that one of the parties is not consenting. So, and with, we did, to see, uh, there are a number of cases coming up, the court <coughs> arising from such a scenario. Sometimes courts have exercised, sometimes they are not exercised. It arises at times when parties have been living apart for 15 years, 20 years. Um, you know that there is nothing left in the marriage after so many years. Then should the court exercise 142 or not? Yes. Um, or as we framed it, should we hedge the power under 142? Yes. By saying in no circumstances. Or we say, well, 142 power exists, or should we careful and do it? That's right. There have been different degrees at which. To that limited extent below, there is an overlap between the two as to how does one look at 142? Yes. What are the powers? That is well not well, very, very covered uh, that, that ground. Subjectivity also will arise from where it is. Yes, Lord. That's that a matter of discretion. Arise, then discretion will always, not even in this matter, otherwise also, yes. is bound to vary a little because we are. Yes, Lord, from case to case. We are uh, not a composite court. We are we are a court of interest. So yes, and, and the conception of, at the end of the day, in the interest of justice, what is the conception of the court of justice? Now, mm -hmm. Lord, that's why I said the second reference is more uh, significant. Because the specific question raised there is whether it's absence of consent by one side, then when can the court use its part in the 142? Lord, I would like to carry the matter one step further with your permission, assuming the answer is yes, which in my opinion it is yes, uh, whether even a trial court can do it uh, in exercise of powers under Section 151 of CRPC. So there are inherent powers in all, uh, CPC. I'm sorry, CPC. Lord, all courts have inherent powers. You are seeking to what we have been doing under 142. If I understand you correctly, I'm only present to appreciate your submission. You are saying give powers to the High Court and Supreme Court, yes. Court also under 155. But yes. The only, um, if you may, in your own way address it, the only impediment seems to be that despite recommendations of the law commissions, yes. to, you will break down a marriage. Yes. The legislature has been reluctant. Yes, right, so both so we, we don't do 142, they like just saying that we grant it. You say, okay, what is that you need? How do you need to maintain? So, yes, it's a balancing between it is. But, my Lord, I would, uh, I would, I have, but the way I have visualized it is that, uh, what is the public policy? Uh, that governs the determination outcome. Now, my Lord, uh, it has always struck me as very strange that our matrimonial laws, they tell you what is the capacity to marry, what is the formality required for marriage, what is the way in which you can exit a marriage. But to the best of my knowledge, there are very few judgments which actually give us an idea of what exactly marriage is all about. 
perhaps a lot it is incapable of definition and that could be the reason why we don't find too many judgments so a lot the way i've approached the issue is i begin by trying to explain with reference to case law how courts have visualized what a marriage ought to be and then move on to the question that if that is not what the marriage consists of as my lord put to me is it dead is it an empty shell is it incapable of resolution then you reach the question what now do we do after this so you know it's very very important to address the question exactly what under all laws under all theories of justice under all theories of matrimonial law how does one conceive of the institution of marriage so you know if you turn to my amicus brief i put it up So, my lord, if your uh, your chief turns to the second brief which I had it today, yeah. uh, definition of marriage and law governing marriages. Yes. Yeah. Before answering the question as framed by the honourable court, it is necessary to point out the substance of marriage as a voluntary union that requires consent by both parties. Under some personal laws, the consent is given explicitly, and under other laws. implied now we learned on a review of the hindu marriage act i found that there is no specific provision saying that the two parties have to consent it is only implied from the fact that both of them have to have the mental capacity to marry whereas in other laws we learned such as uh, islamic law there has to be something called kabool 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 that means you're giving specific consent to marriage it's not say contractual marriage yes there is a specific requirement for consent in many laws but in hindu law my lord it is apparent to me that it's an implied consent because the the, the capacity to marry includes the capacity to give consent yes so my lord will proceed on the assumption that it's a voluntary union in which the voluntary union the fact that it's sacramental in character so when you perform those essential ingredients of marriage um nobody can force you to take a subsidy for it i presume so my lord but there is no specific uh, provision in law yeah. uh, that the party has to give consent but i have personally dealt with cases where women have gone through sath feras and my lord one of my clients in this court uh while she was doing the sath feras she was sending messages to the police commissioner saying i'm not consenting to this marriage and my parents are forcing me into this marriage i filed an article that to petition in this court saying where is the consent and uh, it, it was just uh, well not uh, settled by this honorable court uh, by notice being issued to the parents and they then agreed that all right if she files a petition for divorce we'll not come in the way let the court decide so but be that as it may well not let us proceed on the assumption that all marriage laws require consent that is why i say it's a voluntary union between two people now lord what are the implications flowing from this we move to paragraph 3 all statutes with marriage and divorce namely special marriages act hindu marriage act divorce act parsi marriages act dissolution of marriages act muslim personal law sharia application law deal with capacity to marry the procedure prescribed for formation of a marriage and the manner and method of termination of marriage and divorce however strangely none of them define what is marriage and or what happens during the subsistence of the marriage before dealing with the question of whether free will break down of marriage it is necessary to deal with what exactly is marriage so, in other countries uh, notably we look canberra versus canby 1964 australian uh, law reports unfortunately i was not able to access this judgment have taken it as we produced in a judgment of the delhi high court arvindar kaur versus arvindar singh but your lordship may find a copy in the judges library i'm not sure whether this copy will be available but this is what it says companionship love affection comfort mutual services sexual intercourse all these belong to the married state taken together they make up consortium consortium has been defined as a partnership or association but in the matrimonial sense it implies much more than these rather cold words would suggest it involves the sharing of two lives a sharing of joys and sorrows of each party 
or their successes and disappointments. In its fullest sense, it employs a companionship between each of them, entertainment of mutual friends, sexual intercourse, all these elements which, when combined, justify the whole common law dictum that a man and a wife are one person. Now, my lord, this. Yes, ma'am. As I said, this passage is quoted with a proof. Uh, just a minute, look, before I continue, if your lordship focuses on that last sentence, when combined justify the old common law dictum that a man and a wife are one person, but not with respect, this last sentence requires to be dealt with with great caution because it comes from the doctrine of coverture in common law, which in fact has been abolished. 
it belongs to a time when husband and wife could not sue each other when the debts of one could be recovered from the other when there were many disadvantages for a woman to be married because she was considered one person in the eye of law with her husband she didn't have individual uh, rights as an individual so it has been done away in common law in many different situations and i respectfully submit my lord after recognize the right to autonomy as a fundamental right it certainly is not the law in india this this is about being one person so my lord yes a marriage is definitely an association under indian law which is monogamous in nature but it doesn't follow that the two persons are one in the eye of law that i wish to make very clear because if that was the case my lord there would be no doctrine of divorce at all there would be no question of putting a marriage to an end with procedure prescribed by law uh, and my lord uh, so therefore that one last sentence has to be taken with a bit of caution my lord incidentally I have taken it from the judgment of the Delhi High Court in Harinder Kaur versus Harinder Singh. Mm -hmm. It was a judgment, my lord, which refused to strike down Section Nine of the Hindu Marriages Act mm -hmm. on restitution of conjugal rights on the ground that it was unconstitutional. Uh, the learned judge held, my lord, that introducing constitutional law. Into the family was the famous phrase, my lord, quote unquote, introducing a bull into a china shop. Close unquote. With great respect, my lord, I don't agree, but uh, I must only tell you this: that uh, the challenge to restitution of conjugal rights is also pending consideration in this court, and was listed a few days earlier. So I will not get into that issue. For the moment, uh, I'm just pointing out the source of this. Uh, uh, this. Court. Now, my lord, there's another court from a judgment of this court on what, how do we look at the institution of marriage, and that, my lord, comes from a recent judgment of this court, 2021, sought to define marriage as follows: a marriage is more than a seemingly single, new, simple union between two individuals. As a social institution, all marriages have legal, economic, cultural, and religious ramifications. The norms of a marriage. And the varying degree of legitimacy it may acquire are dictated by factors such as marriage and divorce laws, prevailing social norms, religious diktats. Functionally, marriages are seen as a site for the propagation of social and cultural capital as they help in identifying kinship ties, regulating sexual behavior, and consolidating property and social prestige. Families are a risk. <laughs> Mutual expectation, but I would like to emphasize this sentence. I believe one of my laws was a party to this decision. Families are arranged on the idea of mutual expectation and support, an amity that is meant to be experienced and acknowledged amongst its members. Once the amity breaks apart, the results can be highly devastating and stigmatizing. The primary effects of such breakdown are felt especially by women who may find it hard to guarantee the same degree of social adjustment and support that they enjoyed while they were married. Well, this I rely on for two purposes. One, it gives a good description of what a marriage is meant to be. And two, a lot what happens when that amity, expectation of amity is gone. Can you still continue to call it a marriage? That would be uh, that would be how I would address the question, my lord. And if you cannot, then what are the powers of the court to set the marriage legally asunder? Now, my lord, just one comment over here. And uh, my lord, in law, marriage is generally considered a matter of status, and it is considered to be a status in rem rather than persona. Because, my lord, it is a declaration to the world at large uh, that you are entitled to deal with this couple as a married couple. It's like a holding out doctrine. You hold yourself out as a man and wife. And uh, you socialize together, etc. And then, as this court says, it has implications such as legitimacy of children, um, the welfare of the children. And that is why it's considered a matter of status, not just a matter in persona. Similarly, a decree for divorce is also considered a matter of status. It again is a declaration to the world that I am no longer married to this person. 
So both are ma uh, matters of uh, personam, I'm sorry, rem, and both uh, the uh, divorce decree is always considered a decree in rem. That is the status part of it. So you know, the, the, uh, one of the sequiturs of this argument would be, why is it that a court of law has to give a decree for divorce? Why is it that I can't agree with my husband that you and I are divorced? And that's the end of it. Because it's a matter of status. Because it's a decree in rape. And that is why, you know, the power to grant a divorce is vested in a competent court of law. So the competent court of law will then look into all these other matters before pronouncing a decree for divorce because it has ramifications for people beyond the two, two concerned. All this will not have a link up with my argument that the court ought to grant a degree, degree for irretrievable breakdown because all the factors that are essential to a marriage have disappeared. They, they no longer exist. The only question is how to separate amicably. There is no other question for consideration. And of course, the other question for consideration is welfare, more particularly of the wife and the children. <laughs> I'm in strong disagreement with judgments of this court, which, which seem to indicate, and I believe that the union has filed an affidavit, not in this court, but in the restitution matter, saying that marriage is a sacrament, and it is the public policy of India that we don't break marriages. Well, that is the public policy of many countries in the world. Two different things. Sacramental is how marriage is made, maybe contractual and sacramental. Whether marriage can break or not is not in doubt with the divorce provisions being there in all the things. In fact, now the issue is that um, under the Hindu Marriage Act, uh, Hindu, uh, the divorce is, uh, the whole thing is based on a font theory. That if you have a font, uh, you can't take advantage of that font. I understand. Section but 23 a subsection. If will break down, would have been a ground reality of the situation without getting into a blame theory. Yes. They look too good and it's many, many cases we come before the court. Yes. Two where we have settled it, we have passed, sent to mediation, worked on the wall. Two very good people may not be good partners. It's, it's uh, just one of those things. It's not necessary that sometimes uh, we have come across cases that people have even lived together for a period of time. Then marriage breaks also. Well, the companion is different being married and in the rigors of the marriage, how it works out or... Uh, the well, I understand that in order to answer this reference, one will have to get into the difference between Paul theory of divorce yes. and no Paul theory of divorce, without any doubt. But well, Lord, it's not such a black and white issue. The way I'm going to present it is there is an overlap between the two. And it's going to be my submission that every marriage where that a petition for divorce is filed, and you know from experience, there are allegations and counter allegations. You have never seen a petition in which only one person alleges something and the other does not. There is always that claim and counter claim by two sides. Then the question comes, are you going to look at the fault theory? Mm -hmm. uh, because section 23, subsection 1a specifically says that no party can take advantage of its own wrong. And but not the fault theory in Indian law is smuggled in through Section 23A, no person can take advantage of their own wrong. And well, sometimes your lordships have used the expression, people who come to court must come with clean hands. That's the yeah. limited role of the fault theory. The fault theory has no role beyond that. That's my submission. Well, and also, to my mind, very subjective. What is the fault? See, somebody may say there are allegations made. She does not get up in the morning and give my parents tea. Is it a fault here? Or somebody, you could have done the making of the tea better maybe. Then, uh, so, you know, a lot of them are arising from a social norm. A social norm where you think that the lady must do this or the gent must do this. And from there we attribute faults. So, this is another concern I, we, uh, I have that uh, what we attribute as fault is not really a fault, but it's an understanding of a social norm, how a particular thing ought to be done. Changing social. And a changing social norm is, 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 is very important. 
very rapidly changing now. Rapidly changing now in terms of every couple of years, this now changes. That is the ground reality. Well, no, that is why this court has held that public policy is not frozen in time. Public policy to West Bengal case, the, the West Bengal, I forget the exact course title, but in the where well, the Henry VIII clause was challenged in this honorable court, which allowed for unilateral termination of a contract. And the question was, what is the constitutional validity of that unilateral uh, termination law? There, the court has gone into the whole issue of public policy and held that public policy is not something static in point of time. Similarly, beloved, social norms are not static in point of time. Social norms change. It is no longer possible to argue a case of this kind or any matrimonial issue by relying on the laws of Madhu. And about that, my Lord, I'm very clear. And therefore, my Lord, arguments such as it's a sacrament, and therefore we should not agree to this theory of irretrievable breakdown, do not make any legal sense. Well, that's the 1956 on once used, it was sacrament, always treated as sacrament. 1956, we introduced a divorce, once you oh. introduce a divorce, uh, that in a sacramental marriage, divorce can take place or not. Question is, in that divorce proceeding, should somebody must be attributed a fault, or if two people can't live together, they go for a consent divorce, which was also introduced after some yes. stage of time. Now, the yes. third scenario is which, well, uh, you may think the other person is at fault. He can't somehow sit face to face with you and spend time with you. So, if the court comes to an opinion that this marriage is not uh, capable of any reconciliation, then there's no point in a, in a, in a actually pointless marriage. Uh, which is, as you say, the fundamentals of marriage are absent. And uh, the only other thing is that what terms the marriage should break. You take in, uh, protection and protect the women in whatever way. Sometimes women are actually better off than the men. So they don't even, they, I've, we've seen cases where they agree that as long as this, I, I've seen cases where normally the women resist, the man was resisting. And what's your problem? She doesn't want anything. She is has a better capacity to earn, a better position. But the man doesn't want to let go. I, I've exercised 142 even in those cases and granted saying that this is being obdurate unnecessary. Yeah. People have not laid for a couple of years. Yes. It works now, today works both ways. Yes. So because, the because, because the law is gender neutral. The law itself is gender neutral alone. Yes. It will work both ways. Can we carry on tomorrow? Yes, sir.